Alright, sorry about the longer than usual wait between videos everyone. I was going through some stuff and just needed a break. Who wouldn't after hearing that the Mario movie got delayed? This means I have to wait until spring of next year to hear Seth Rogen's inevitable Oscar winning performance of Donkey Kong. Let's do all the drugs. Okay, all jokes aside, thank you for your patience. Last time we finished looking at Donkey Kong Country 3, and after its release in 1996, the series went on a... 14 year long hiatus, that doesn't sound right. Let's delve a little deeper. The DKC franchise had made its mark in gaming. Every game up to this point was great in their own ways. The series became so popular that it even got a TV show. This is God's greatest creation. Let's shift our attention over to an era that Nintendo fans remember fondly. The time when Nintendo got their asses kicked by Sony. The first time of many. The Nintendo 64 was filled with its highs and lows, and a lot of the highs were thanks to Rare's restless efforts. Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, Killer Instinct, Jet Force Gemini, Conker's Bad Fur Day. What? All Rareware projects, they were working over overtime. And since pretty much every IP was making the jump to 3D around this time, you bet that Rare capitalized on the 3D craze by bringing Donkey Kong Country to this new dimension. Except, not exactly. Donkey Kong 64, like Super Mario 64 before it, was just built different. This was a collectathon set in the Donkey Kong Country universe and now lives in infamy as that one game nobody likes fully completing. That's a story for another time. Rare continued to prove themselves as a vital asset to Nintendo, and I'm sure they continued producing quality games for Nintendo's future systems. That didn't last long. Often seen as one of the most baffling acquisitions in the industry now that we know what it led to, Microsoft bought out Rare in 2002, which meant that Rare had to cancel several projects that they had been cooking up for the GameCube. And most relevant to this video, this meant that Donkey Kong Country was left without a developer. Now, you may think that Nintendo themselves could take over if they ever wanted to make another entry, but the weird thing I've noticed about Nintendo is that once they hand over one of their franchises to another developer, they suddenly contract the case of Poo Poo Brain and are lost when they have to do something within that series again. I'm jumping forward about a decade for the sake of giving an example, but for Mario Kart 7, Nintendo reached out to Retro Studios to create the assets for Jungle oh. Hijinx from Returns. I mean, who better to help out with that track than the guys behind the game it's based on, I guess? Still Still, it's a little silly. Over the next couple of years, Donkey Kong would go on to star in a few other games like Donkey Kong Jungle Beat and the Donkey Kong line of games that have the greatest control method known to mankind. He co-starred in the Mario vs Donkey Kong games and of course still had a presence in spin-offs like Mario Party. As for the country series though, after the GBA ports were finished, it was put on pause. Enter the Nintendo Wii, one of Nintendo's most successful consoles because of its ability to attract filthy casuals who still think the Game Boy is relevant. The Wii era is also when Nintendo started allocating more resources into developing 2D games after the rising interest in retro titles. You know, simpler times. Simpler. Now enter Retro Studios. Of course, these guys are famous for creating the Metroid Prime series, turning Metroid from a 2D game into a 3D first-person adventure. One day Nintendo took a good look at Metroid Prime and thought, yes, make a Donkey Kong game. Okay, it's not as random as how I presented it. The president and CEO of Retro happens to be a former Nintendo of America employee who worked on the first three DKC games. For this new installment, Retro wanted to go back to basics to make this a true successor to the Rareware titles. And thus, the fittingly titled Donkey Kong Country Returns was made and released on November 21st, 2010 in North America. Any doubts folks may have had over Retro Studios spearheading the project disappeared upon the game's release. Needless to say, Retro Retro outdid themselves. This is an excellent first attempt at a Donkey Kong Country game and is a more than worthy follow up to the three games that preceded it. Let's see here, I got the game in early 2011 so I still wasn't all that privy to gaming news. I was too busy watching Chugga Conroy to know what the hell journalism even was. So the way that I found out about Donkey Kong Country Returns was at Costco. The game section was the only thing that kept me entertained when my family went grocery shopping there and one day. I just happened to see it. I begged my parents to buy it for me, they did, and that was one of the most painful car rides back home that I have ever experienced. And when I finally got to play Returns, a wave of nostalgia completely overtook me. 
I loved every second of that first playthrough. It was like the Donkey Kong Country I grew up with, only it looked way better, the levels were so fun and interesting, and ow my arms. So, the Wii version of Donkey Kong Country Returns is the version I played for this review, but 5 years after it came out, it got ported to the Nintendo 3DS. On the Wii, the game runs at 60 frames per second and certain actions require motion controls. The 3DS version maps every command to buttons, which automatically makes this the best version to play, right? Well, yes and no. I vastly prefer the control scheme here, don't get me wrong, but the frame rate is now cut in half. I don't even really mind the lower resolution, but 30 FPS for a fast paced platformer isn't unplayable, but I'm not a big fan of it. That's not all though, this version has a new mode called New Mode that gives each Kong an extra hit point and adds a couple of new items to the in game shop. And most notably, the post game has seven brand new stages. Now, I would have put my feelings about the 30 FPS cap aside so that I could show off these levels in more detail, if it weren't for the sad fact that I can't get footage of this version. I don't have a 3DS capture card, and while I used the 3DS emulator Citra to get footage of Samus Returns when I reviewed that game, you may also remember from that video that I have a Mac, and Mac don't have the best gaming support. As such, a lot of games I've tried on Citra are very laggy and or buggy, Returns 3D included. So what I'll say is this, if you can tolerate a slightly worse looking and performing port of this game, then the 3DS version has better controls and is a bit more rich in content. Any one of these though is worth your time and money. You know the drill at this point, let's look at the story first. You're going to notice a recurring theme throughout this video, and that's me making comparisons between this game and the first Donkey Kong Country game. Returns is most inspired by that game in particular, and that inspiration can be seen as early as the opening cutscene cause, oh no, the banana horde has been taken again. However, the Kremlings have nothing to do with it. Returns introduces a new faction of villains known as the Tiki Tak Tribe, comprised of these sentient Tiki masks that can mind control the inhabitants of DK Island, all except Donkey and Diddy Kong. I'm assuming they watch such an unhealthy amount of the Donkey Kong Country TV show, by that I mean two minutes, that their heads are so empty that they are unaffected by the Tiki spell. And Donkey responds in the only way he knows how. Violence. After making their way through the island and defeating each one of the Tiki commanders, the Kongs reach the top of the volcano, witness a would-be gory ritualistic sacrifice if this game was rated M, and put an end to Tiki Tong's shenanigans by crushing his tower with the fucking moon. Glad to see that DKC silliness is still intact. The Tiki suck. Nobody likes them, they have a pretty catchy theme song, but they're not very memorable. Other than that... It's Grand Theft Banana again, what do you want me to say? I like the pre-rendered FMVs at the beginning and end of the game. They're animated really well and the ending ones in particular give a nice sense of finality. This clip always pumps me up. It's the same story as DKC1, but with a less interesting group of villains. Sad to say that the Kremlings aren't in Tropical Freeze either, and I've always found their absence in these games to be odd. Is there a licensing issue? Does Nintendo not own the full rights to the Kremlings? If Retro ever makes a third DKC game, I really hope that they come back. Donkey Kong Country Returns. What a perfect name. Not just because this is a return to the franchise, but because this game can be summed up by simply reading the title out loud. Donkey Kong Country Returns. Retro Studios essentially reimagined the first Donkey Kong Country right down to its gameplay, setting, music, and even its drawbacks. Not one to one mind you, and I in no way am insinuating that this is a bad thing. I adore DKC1, and I don't think there's anything wrong with a series revival borrowing ideas from the game that most people remember, and Retro would later come out of their comfort zone with a follow-up to Returns. Like I said, Returns is like a reimagining. Retro put their own spin on the formula that makes their take on Donkey Kong Country different and, in some ways, more engaging. We're back to just having two Kongs, Donkey and Diddy. Yes, for the first time since the original, we get to play as the character whose name is on the freaking box. The basics are all here and accounted for. Donkey Kong can still jump on or roll into enemies. The mid-air jump after a roll remains intact and actually gives you way more horizontal distance than before. Barrels and other items can still be picked up and tossed, though I don't know what it is, but I've never gotten used to the new arc at which DK tosses things. He's still got the... Banana! which is now used to interact with various parts of the level in order to progress in conjunction with being used to uncover hidden collectibles. New to Donkey Kong's moveset is the blow, and it pretty much serves the same function as the Donkey can now also do what gamers dread, 
touch grass. Certain walls and ceilings are now climbable, and just as a quick tip, if it looks like it leads somewhere out of the camera's view, it probably does. Now, here's where things really start to differ from the SNES trilogy. Diddy Kong is back as your companion, but unless you're playing with a buddy in co-op mode that I wasn't able to show off because who the hell am I going to play this game with, you can no longer choose who's in the lead. Now when you free Diddy from a DK barrel, he hops on Donkey's back and provides a couple of benefits including a continuous roll and best of all, his jetpack that allows you to stay in the air for a short period of time by holding the jump button. It's nothing compared to Dixie's floating ability, but nevertheless, it's an invaluable move to have in some of the game's tough for platforming challenges. Diddy also adds an additional two hearts to your health. By default, Donkey can only get hit twice before losing a life, meaning you can now have a maximum of four hearts with their powers combined. Am I bummed that you can't play as Diddy on his own in the single player? Well, not really actually, because Donkey Kong even by himself is perfectly capable of taking on any and all obstacles along the journey. Using him no longer feels like a handicap, and you still get Diddy's perks if you can keep him alive. Except for his peanut pop gun that's exclusive to co-op. Functionally, it's not all that different to how it was handled previously, except you can no longer throw your partner like in DKC 2 and 3. And thanks to the camera being much more zoomed out, which gets rid of the screen crunch that I have complained about in the last three videos, on top of the excellent, precise movement and feel of the gameplay, this is by far one of the best controlling 2D platformers of all time, and the best controlling DKC game yet, if you're playing the 3DS version. Donkey Kong Country Returns is a Nintendo Wii game, need I say more? Now, I'm not some motion control hater. In certain cases, I firmly believe motion controls can elevate gameplay in a way that traditional controls can't. If you watched my Skyward Sword review, you know I preferred the motion controls on the Switch version. Metroid Prime Trilogy is my favorite way to revisit the first two Prime games, and I still instinctively shake the Joy-Con when playing Galaxy via the 3D All-Stars collection. Guess who's a hypocrite? But note that I said that motion controls can elevate the gameplay, because in other cases, they do the exact opposite. It. They become intrusive and frustrating to deal with, such as in a fast-paced platformer. The roll, the blow, the banana are all activated by shaking the Wiimote, which means you're gonna shake this thing again, and again, and again. It's even worse with the Wiimote and Nunchuck. I've been playing Returns with the Wiimote on its side since my first playthrough because I only have to shake one thing. If you plug in the nunchuck, it's nice that you no longer have to hold a button to run, but now you have to shake both peripherals if you want to do the continuous roll or blow or... As I stated, if you have the 3DS version, you don't have to deal with this nonsense. It's one of my least favorite things about Returns as a whole, but I also wouldn't say that it's a deal breaker by any stretch. Retro Studios modernized and refined nearly everything else I loved about the Rare games. I'd say their crowning achievement with both Returns and Tropical Freeze is the level design, one of, if not the most important thing to get right in a platformer. I tried guys, I really tried finding a lackluster level in this game, any level that I could confidently say has some kind of glaring design flaw or stupid gimmick, but I couldn't. DKC Returns manages to give us bigger stages that are so dense and filled with exhilarating set pieces at almost every waking second. So many of these stages are like amusement park rides, uninterrupted bursts of adrenaline-filled platforming perfection. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, almost every level gives you something different to do, something different to appreciate and be mesmerized by. A lot of times you'll be switching between the background and foreground, almost as if this game was originally designed for the 3DS and not the Wii. It's cool in this game, not so cool in Smash Brothers. that one sucks. There's so many amazing levels and I'd love to talk about all of them, but I'd be here all day if I did that. The silhouette levels are breathtaking, and I wish this game had more of them. There's a whole world dedicated to the vehicles you can ride, from the returning minecart from DKC1 and the rocket barrel from DKC3. These levels perfectly encapsulate the amusement park ride analogy I used earlier. As a kid, I used to replay these all the time. It's a bit of a hassle when going after the Kong letters, but ignoring that, they're just plain fun. And the rocket barrel is nothing like that frustrating piece of junk from Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. Now it's used in left to right auto scrollers like the minecarts, and you have to control its altitude by holding the jump button to ascend and letting go to descend, though on two occasions it harkens back to its roots a bit. 
And don't even get me started on World 7, which houses my personal favorite platforming stages, mainly because I adore the factory setting with all the moving machinery. I especially love the levels where you have to find the red switches to power the rocket you'll use at the end of the world to reach the boss. It's a seamless way of tying your actions in the levels to actual story progression. I wouldn't call these levels bad, but World 2 is probably my least favorite. Beach settings have never really been my thing in platformers. However, Stormy Shore sticks out thanks to Squidicus, this giant octopus that terrorizes you throughout the entire level. Speaking of settings, you may have noticed from the footage that the level themes in Returns are a lot more tame. This links back to what I mentioned about Returns taking a lot of cues from the first Donkey Kong Country game. You're on DK Island again, even though the Donkey Kong shaped mountainside is sadly missing. The world order follows a very safe template. The first world is jungle themed, second world is beach themed, third world is temple themed, fourth world is mine themed, fifth world is forest themed, sixth world is cliff themed, seventh world is factory themed, eighth world is volcano themed, and the ninth world is LSD themed. Not only do we not really see any level themes that we haven't already seen, but this may sound weird considering how much I gushed about how great the stages are here, but the sheer quantity of stages can make certain worlds feel a little long for their own good. After the ninth cliff level, visual boredom can start to set in after staring at the same assets for the last hour or two of gameplay. Personally, this has never really bugged me. It's something I only really noticed during my latest playthrough. I'm merely pointing it out as a potential criticism some may have about this game. Again, the good thing is that these stages are a blast to play through. And for those who may be worried that Retro chickened out on the difficulty since this released on a console that could pass off as a Mattel product, put those worries aside because Returns honors the original trilogy's reputation for being hard. Nothing worthy of breaking your controller over, most of the time, but it's no walk in the park either. There's a much greater variety of enemies, no matter how forgettable a lot of them may be, and lots of them require different strategies to avoid them. And it bears repeating, these levels are nuts. Your reflexes have to be on point, and be careful about bum rushing into the unknown, cause more than likely, it will result in death. Thankfully, Cranky Kong is here to alleviate some of your stress by selling helpful items you can bring into levels that range from invincibility potions to an extra hit point. He also sells keys that unlock different paths on the world map, opening the way to optional stages. You pay him in banana coins, but trust me, they're so abundant that you don't need to be concerned about running low, especially if you always go after that DK bonus at the end of each level to get a multiplier of up to 15 of a certain item. No need to pay for saving or anything like that either, in fact, the game auto saves after every level. But the trade off is you now have to suffer through some pretty long loading screens. Technology everybody, it stinks. Well, that's not completely true because better technology means we have more graphical power to work with. Now, I'm actually one of those people that prefers when 2D games go for a pixelated art style, or better yet, a hand-drawn art style. The only thing I don't like about 2.5D is the very real possibility that it will one day look dated. Donkey Kong Country Returns is one of the best looking games on the Wii and maintains a silky smooth 60fps throughout, but yeah, you can definitely see its age now. The Wii was underpowered even when it released, so the character models don't have a lot of polygons resulting in some subtle, albeit noticeable blockiness, and the game isn't in HD so there's a lot of jaggies. Don't even get me started on the 3DS version in that department. For the hardware it's on, it looks great, but in my opinion, the Rareware games did a better job at remaining timeless despite the unorthodox nature of the visuals. They looked great then, and they still look great now. But how about that music? You all know by now that I am very fond of the original soundtracks. By the way, quick side note, if you want to experience these amazing songs at a whole other level of quality, check out these soundtrack restorations composed by Jam and Sam Miller on YouTube. They are nothing short of magnificent and deserve all the attention they can get. Listening to the Mining Melancholy restoration put me in a state of speechlessness that delayed this review by a full week since I couldn't record the script. Anyways, the soundtrack in returns is extremely good. Most of it is made up of modern remixes of classic songs from DKC1 like Jungle Hijinks, Voices of the Temple, Treetop Rock, Fear Factory, the list goes on and on. But the new compositions made specifically for this game deserve attention as well, there's some great shit in here. Sticking with the tone of the first game, a lot of the new songs try to be ambient and atmospheric. But when the situation calls for something more intense, the music delivers. The last world is filled with these foreboding, serious tunes, and then there's the best new song here, the Rocket Barrel theme. Getting a big band to play in these levels, count me the hell in. The soundtrack is also very dynamic. The overworld theme changes slightly depending on the area of the island you're in. Music 
songs like Minecart Madness transform to match the level setting, it's very impressive and goes to show that a lot of care was put into the OST. And when you beat the game, oh my god, could it be? The return of Credit Concerto? Alright, other than that, heartbreaking tease, Kenji Yamamoto did some damn fine work and is a worthy replacement for David Wise as this game's main composer. Every boss even has their own unique theme, and now that I've intentionally brought them up to make a smooth transition into my next point, the bosses in returns are freaking incredible. Alright, they're not all winners. The mole fight isn't terribly exciting and doesn't last very long when you figure out you can roll jump to the front of the train to skip this phase completely. And they just couldn't resist reusing World 1's boss for World 6, only now he's purple and has a couple more tricks up his sleeve. But almost every other boss annihilates the bosses from the original trilogy in terms of creativity, strategy, and challenge. The easiest and most disappointing boss to me is the final one, him and his bongo bongo from Ocarina of Time as weakness. Hmm, I wonder what I have to do. Colonel Pluck has got to be my favorite. He's the boss that always gives me the most shit, but it's a good challenge. I like the gimmick of having to sneak between his legs and... Uh, on second thought, this is pretty suggestive, so I won't say anything else. I'm just happy to finally be able to say with confidence that the bosses in a Donkey Kong Country game aren't cakewalks. They are exciting, have interesting designs that make up for the boring designs of their Tiki masters, and fighting them is so impactful thanks to the audience in the arena. Okay, I'm overdue for complaints, so... Let's just get this over with. Animal Buddies, how I took thee for granted. Donkey Kong Country Returns only has two Animal Buddies. Squawks can only be bought in the shop and lets you know when there's a puzzle piece nearby in the level. Oh, we'll get to these in a bit. That leaves Rambi as the only Animal Buddy you can ride. He can kill enemies with his horn and has a continuous dash, but riding him nerfs your jump height and Diddy's jetpack. Those aren't compromises I'm personally willing to make. So not only is there just one rideable animal buddy, he also sucks. The animal buddies in the other games, when done right, had interesting abilities that allowed for more varied level design and special scenarios that weren't possible with the ordinary movesets of the Kongs. The level design in Returns is already top-notch, but Rambi doesn't really enhance any of the stages he's in. Rambi's main purpose is to discover bonus rooms. And oh, bonus rooms, what did they do to you? Look on a mask with my boy. Bonus rooms in DKC 2 and 3, heck even a good chunk of the ones in DKC 1, were unique. Time and real effort was used to craft these intricate, bite-sized minigames that didn't feel compromised compared to the rest of the game, and rewarded you with something useful when you completed them. In returns, they all look the fucking same. The same objective of collecting all the bananas before time runs out for every single one. And the layouts get reused over and over again because there's a pool of like only seven different ones for them to choose from. And when you complete them, you no longer get collectibles that are needed to unlock more content or an expanded moveset or a new animal buddy or the location of Jimmy Hoffa, nothing like that. You get a puzzle piece. Puzzle pieces are hidden in levels and earned from completing bonus rooms, and getting all the puzzle pieces in a level nets you a new entry in one of the galleries in the main menu. Now look, there's nothing wrong with rewards that don't factor into your completion percentage. It's neat that there's a way to unlock other types of bonuses that longtime fans would appreciate. But if you want to fill out the galleries, you have to play every single monotonous bonus room, and there's so many. They're not fun, they're tedious, they only interrupt the flow of the excellent gameplay loop. It's not worth it. You know what? I'm happy that these aren't required for 100% anymore, cause I wouldn't be able to do it. Fortunately, unlockable levels and a post-game do return, but this has some downsides as well. There is now one secret to difficult level in each world that is made available after finding every Kong letter in every single stage in that world. Previously, collecting all the Kong letters in a level gave you an extra life. Now, they are the main collectible. But instead of being inside fun bonus rooms, which in turn made the process of obtaining the tokens in DKC 2 and 3 fun, the letters are just... there. Unless you enjoy torture, there's not a lot of incentive to explore these expansive levels anymore. This is probably why these levels in World 7 are so appealing to me. They give me an excuse to investigate my surroundings without the fear of landing in some- no! 
The good thing is that getting all the Kong letters is well worth it in my opinion, because the levels they open contain ass clench worthy platforming segments that I love trying to conquer. Reaching the end of each of these mysterious temples gives you a crystal orb. Nabbing all 8 unlocks World 9 after you beat the game. Donkey and Diddy are transported to a hallucinogenic banana dream world after eating from the Golda Banana- No! As I brought up, the 3DS version adds 7 new levels to World 9 while the Wii version only has the 1. Which, I can't really get mad about considering that I already played 8 unlockable levels to get here. After doing all of this, Mirror Mode becomes available in every level. The stage is now flipped horizontally, you can only use Donkey Kong, and you only have one heart. Great for those who want more replay value, but the main adventure was sufficient for me. And I'm honestly not good enough to beat every level in Mirror Mode, though your percentage does go up with every Every stage you beat, and each mirrored stage has its own set of Kong letters and its own set of terrible bonus rooms. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll stop. Donkey Kong Country Returns is no doubt a stellar video game. The level variety and design, gameplay, controls, music, difficulty, and bosses match or exceed what came before. But sadly, Retro Studios missed the mark on some key ingredients that to me make Donkey Kong Country so special with the biggest offense being the wretched integration of bonus rooms into the experience. You may think that I'm exaggerating my thoughts about the bonus rooms and returns, but I'm really not. They were butchered so hard in my eyes that I can't ignore it. If it doesn't bother you, that's great, I envy you. But like with my complaints about the 100% cleanups in Metroid Fusion, Zero Mission, Samus Returns, and Dread, which I received a little bit of resentment over in a few comments in those videos, I have to and most importantly want to talk about this stuff that I'm passionate about because, guys, these are personal retrospectives. If everyone shared the same opinions about everything, this entire subgenre of YouTube content would be super boring and there'd be no reason to watch other people's reviews. Returns has a couple of things that really annoy me, but that doesn't take away from it being an outstanding 2D platformer still filled with that iconic DKC charm. Too bad this came out when they changed Donkey Kong's voice. Come on, where's the... This game deserves a remaster on the Switch, with updated visuals and the controls and extras from the 3DS version. It would fit right in on the console that also happens to have Retro Studios' second and to this day latest project starring the Prime Primates, Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Our last stop on this Donkey Kong Country retrospective. Until next time, be safe, take care, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you for watching.